morning and welcome to our online worship service here at United. Uh, the events that have taken place in our world over the past several days have completely changed our lives. I'm sure none of us ever imagined being holed up in our homes like this. Uh, isolation will help to stop the spread of the virus, but unfortunately, uh, isolation increases the spread of fear. Most of us are used to gathering together at times like this uh, to be able to talk and to pray together. So we need to find new ways to gather together as the church. It is my hope and it is the hope of others that we use uh, the technology that we have so that we can bridge the gap of isolation. Uh, look for ways that we can meet together or minister together as the church, but doing it through other means. Uh, I encourage you to please uh, keep checking our website. Uh, also, uh, check our Facebook page to keep up to date on opportunities for worship, uh, for Bible study, uh, and also for times of prayer. Uh, I encourage those of you that have prayer concerns to simply email your prayer concerns into us or you may call and leave a message on the office uh, voicemail, and we will take those prayer concerns, and we will get them out to the congregation through email and through our uh, telephone prayer chain uh, so that we can continue to pray for one another. And I encourage uh, each of us in these days, uh, I encourage you to uh, be praying for one another and encouraging one another. I also encourage you to please take time to call some of our senior members uh, that have, maybe you have a connection with some of them, uh, please call them and find out how they're doing, if they need anything. Uh, for many of them, it is risky uh, for them to go out and restock their food and other necessities that they may need. And so those of us in the congregation that are younger and that are in uh, good health, uh, if you could run errands for them, uh, that would be a way that you could minister to the body of Christ. And so I encourage you, though, to take precautions, if you do that, to keep yourself and to keep others safe. Uh, please don't stop being the church uh, just because we can't meet together in the church building. Uh, before I share from the Word, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that no matter what we go through, no matter what the situation, you are always with us. And so, Father, I do pray for our world at large, uh, the situation that is taking place with the virus. Father, I know that there are many that are living in fear. And so, Father, I pray that we as the church, as the body of Christ, I pray that we might reach out to those, be it through telephone, through text, uh, in whatever way we can, to simply just come alongside of those that are living in fear. And may we share the peace and the love of Jesus Christ with them. Father, we thank you for the technology that we have, that we can use to be able to connect ourselves with one another. And so, Father, I pray that over these next several weeks, the opportunities that we have to reach out uh, as a church and the community and reach right into the homes of those uh, that are just uh, needing someone to listen to them, needing someone to encourage them. Father, I pray that we would take advantage of those opportunities. And Father, I do pray today for those in our congregation that are struggling with uh, being at home and not being able to be out and around friends and to socialize. Father, I pray uh, that we will have the opportunities to just share with one another, to talk with one another, to pray with one another. Father, we do pray for our leaders around the world that are seeking answers and seeking ways to be able to, to combat the virus. Father, we just commit all of this into your hand, and we ask that you give them guidance, that they seek you for for guidance and decisions that need to be made. Father, uh, everything is in your hands. And so, Father, we look to you uh, for what you're going to do in and through our lives, even in this situation, even in this crisis. Father, we ask your blessing on each of us as we uh, spend time in your word. Uh, speak to us. Father, I pray that you would speak to us uh, this morning through your word. Uh, may you open our ears, open our eyes to the things that you want us to not only know, but to also act upon in our lives. So, Father, speak to us today, we pray, and we pray this in Christ's name. 
as we have been digging into the chapters of John's Gospel, uh, John has given us a glimpse into the upper room the night that Jesus met with his disciples. And the disciples have learned lessons of humility, on holiness, uh, they've learned about the Holy Spirit, and last week I shared with you from uh, John chapter 15 where we looked at Jesus' words concerning remaining in his love. And today we're going to look at what Jesus tells his disciples about joy. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 16. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 16 as Jesus shares with his disciples about, turning, uh, about taking grief and turning it to joy. And so beginning in verse 16, Jesus says to them, In a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. And so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now in your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I come from the Father and, en and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. There are many things that are interchangeable. When you're baking, you can use butter or you can use margarine. When you want to drink orange juice to get your vitamin C, you can do that. Or if you don't like orange juice, the alternative, it's interchangeable, you can simply take a vitamin pill to get your vitamin C. You can use paper clips to hold paper together, or you can use a staple. They're interchangeable. You can use either one. But when it comes to joy and happiness, they're not interchangeable. Happiness is based on circumstances. And there are a lot of unhappy people right now. Uh, unhappy because they can't go to a basketball game or a hockey game. Unhappy because they can't go to the movies with friends, or unhappy because their vacation plans have been ruined. Circumstances affect our happiness. Happiness is fleeting, whereas joy is a permanent possession. So what makes joy different than happiness? First of all, joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5 that we've looked at over the past several Sundays, uh, we see that joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit uh, that is produced in our lives when we're walking in the Spirit. And when Jesus was born, uh, all the way back when we were going through the season of Advent and we were uh, leading up to the birth of Jesus Christ for Christmas Eve, uh, we remember the passage in Luke's Gospel where uh, the angels announced that I bring you good tidings of great joy. 
And so the angels announced news that was of great joy. Jesus himself demonstrated joy in his ministry. In fact, the Pharisees even accused Jesus of being too joyful. Uh, they, they accused him in, in Luke chapter 7 where, where Luke reports, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Uh, Jesus had a, a ministry of joy, and there were those that even accused him of being too joyful. In many of Jesus' parables that he shared, he focused on, on joy. If you turn to Luke chapter 15, uh, there are three parables that Luke records there that Jesus is talking about joy. Each one of those parables ends in joy. The lost sheep ends with a joyful shepherd. A lost coin ends with a joyful woman. And a lost son ends with a joyful father. Luke also records Jesus sharing that there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sin sinner repents. One of the characteristics of the early church was joy. They gathered together and they enjoyed each other's company and they rejoiced together. Luke records in Acts chapter 2 of the, the believers gathering at the temple, gathering together and and he says they ate together in their homes, happy to share their food with joyful hearts. And they were living in a day and a time of persecution where there were those uh, that would throw them in jail for their faith. And yet they had that joy that couldn't be stopped. That joy that just overflowed from them. Acts chapter 13, Luke reports, but the believers were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. It just flowed out of them. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you should be filled with joy no matter what your circumstances. And that's what the Apostle Paul wrote about to the churches in Philippi and to Thessalonica. Uh, he shared with them, he told them to be full of joy in the Lord and always be joyful. And it had nothing to do with circumstances. It had nothing to do uh, with what was presently going on in your life. Because that's the, the difference between happiness and joy. Your happiness is going to go up and down uh, regarding the circumstances around you. But joy comes from within. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we're to be filled with joy. And so how can we as Christians be joyful when we look around us and we see what's happening? We see lives and livelihoods of people in our communities uh, that are being affected by the coronavirus. And so we look at that, and how can we be joyful? The disciples of Jesus found themselves in some very frightening circumstances, some very difficult circumstances. And they had the same question, how can we be joyful in a situation like this? As they sat with Jesus in the upper room, and as they heard Jesus say to them that he would be leaving them for a little while, that just turned everything upside down. The disciples didn't know what he meant by this. They had spent three and a half years of their lives with Jesus. He taught them. He fed them. He cared for them. He had become the center of their lives. Everything they did revolved around him. And now Jesus is telling them that he's going to leave them for a little while. Look at their reaction in verse 18. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. The disciples were alarmed at this. Their world was about to be turned upside down. I mean, our world right now is being turned upside down. Everything that we had relied on, we're no longer sure about it. Uh, things that we took for granted are, are, you know, things like fully stocked grocery stores uh, that we could go to when we need the, the food and the necessities. We're concerned about that. If the entertainment venues that brought us fun and happiness, that has all changed. Gathering with friends for a night out and to just have some social time, that has changed. And all... All of these things has, has just changed overnight. 
And our world has been turned upside down. So how can we have joy in the midst of all of this? The disciples struggled to find joy uh, because that news that Jesus shared with them, you know, I'm sure the events that happened in the hours after Jesus shared those words with them, I'm sure it was a complete surprise to them. Uh, they feared for their lives because Jesus, only hours later, was arrested and he was taken before the Sanhedrin. And so the disciples run away in fear. In fact, one of the disciples even denies that he even knows Jesus. Their joy was about to be gone because of the events. But yet that's not what affects joy, the circumstances. Their happiness is what they were losing because they were very happy having Jesus as the center of their world and to take care of their needs and to be there to teach them. And so it was a happy time for them. But their joy, they were going to be overjoyed when Jesus returned. Because when Jesus returned to them, not only did they have him back as the center of their lives, the center of their world, but they also would have eternal life. So how can we find joy in the midst of what's happening over these past few days? How can we have joy? How do we stop dwelling on the difficulties? How do we stop allowing our circumstances and our situation to rob us of joy? It can rob us of happiness, but Jesus gives us a simple answer when it comes to the joy. Because the circumstances need not affect the joy that we have. And Jesus' simple answer is this. God brings joy to our lives, not by substitution but by transformation. Look at the illustration that Jesus uses here. This is the heart of his lesson when it comes to joy. Look at verses 20 and 21. He says, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. And then Jesus uses the illustration of a woman that is giving birth. He says, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, look what he says. She forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child has been born into the world. In this illustration that Jesus uses, he shows us that the same baby that caused the pain is the same baby that causes the joy. God doesn't substitute something else to relieve the pain. Rather, he's able to use that and transform it. Every parent knows what it's like to have a very unhappy child because of a broken toy. Most of us probably have had to deal with that when our children were younger. And broken toys, they happen. It's a fact of life. But as a parent, if we substitute another toy, one right after another, when one breaks, just to make the child happy, soon they're spoiled. And they grow up expecting that every problem can simply be solved by a substitution. And they don't learn that that's not the secret of joy and happiness. Substitution creates a very immature adult that basically they're never really happy. And so they just keep substituting one thing for another to find that happiness. But what God does is he transforms our sadness. He transforms our grief. And he transforms it into joy. The Greek word that's used here uh, for turn is, is translated uh, transition or transform. Jesus didn't say that the mother's pain was replaced by joy. No, he said her pain was transformed into joy. Because God takes seemingly impossible situations and he does a miracle of his grace and he transforms troubles into triumphs. He transforms grief into joy. He transforms sadness into great joy. And he did it in the Old Testament. If you look at Joseph 
His brother sold him into slavery, into Egypt. They, uh, they wanted to get rid of him. But God transformed that bad situation that happened in Joseph's life into great joy. It reunited a family that, uh, that and basically saved their lives from starvation. God used that situation and he transformed that into something that was great joy. God did that with the disciples. Uh, they were grieving the loss of their leader, of their master, their friend, because he uh, was going to be taken off and crucified. And many of them ran away during that period of time. And they thought their hopes and their dreams were crushed. They saw this as an awful thing that was happening. But their sadness and their grief, it was transformed into joy when Jesus arose from the grave and he comes back to them. And he comes back to them with eternal life and able to offer them eternal life. God transformed that situation into something that became great joy. And as we sit in our homes, isolated from the world, we have a great deal of time to connect with God and our families. You know, how often do we rush through the day and not take time for prayer, or take time to spend in the Word, reading the Scriptures, and allowing God to speak to us, taking time to, to spend that quiet time with our Heavenly Father, because we're too busy running off in so many directions. You know, how many families are pulled in different directions because they have such a busy schedule that they can't even connect with one another, hold a conversation for very long. I mean, how many parents uh, really have time to spend with their children one-on-one, -on -one, face to face for a long period of time? How many of us get to chat with a neighbor next door? Uh, we just, oftentimes, we're simply just living in a house right next door to someone that our comings and goings are different than their schedule, and so we don't even we don't even take time to pass a hello to them. Wouldn't it be ironic if this isolation actually broke down walls of isolation between God and us, between others and us? The lesson that Jesus teaches us here the lesson that we need to learn is this. God brings joy to our lives, not by substitution, but by transformation. No matter what your circumstances, no matter what the problem at hand, God takes impossible situations and he transforms them into works of joy. Father, we thank you for every and any situation and circumstance that we find ourselves in. We know that James wrote concerning trials and tribulations, and he told us uh, to not look at them as a burden, but to welcome them as an opportunity for you to work a work in our lives and strengthen our faith and to give us joy. And so, Father, I pray that even in these days ahead, as many of us uh, are having a difficult time isolated in our homes, Father, I pray that we would not look at this as, uh, uh, as a bad thing, but Father, as an opportunity for us to be able to connect in other ways with people around us. Father, may we use this as ways to minister uh, to those that often we don't even see. Uh, we often are so busy that we just neglect to even say hello to them. Father, may we, uh, as followers of Jesus Christ, see this situation as a door of opportunity to share your love and your grace and your mercy with a world right now that is living in fear. Father, may we bring them the joy of Jesus Christ. Father, may we live the joy that's inside of us, even though we live in these difficult circumstances. Father, just calm our hearts. Give us peace that we might share that peace and that joy with those around us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.